Welcome to the Mind Gut Conversation, your go to podcast for exploring cutting edge ideas in optimal health and the fascinating science of mind gut microbiome interactions. I'm your host, Emma Meyer. Here we bring together thought leaders, groundbreaking researchers, and innovative practitioners to share insights that can transform the way you understand your body, mind, and overall well being. Whether you're a health enthusiast, a curious learner, or a professional in the field, this podcast is your gateway to unlocking the secrets of the mind-gut connection. So settle in, open your mind, and join us as we journey into the science and stories shaping the future of health. Today, I will be my own guest, and I'll talk about a topic that often comes up in social media, questions, comments, and also that I hear often from my patients. And this has to do with small intestinal bacterial overgrowth or SIBO. SIBO seems like if you listen to the ongoing online conversations and patient stories, you would think that SIBO is a very common condition responsible for many of the gut issues that patients complain about um, and that a very effective treatment is to take an antibiotic, rifaximin, at a time when we discourage the non-scientific use of antibiotics to all patients to protect um, the gut microbiome, the health of the microbial ecosystem. So today I will be talking briefly about aspects of the whole SIBO controversy, both in terms of its validity as a diagnosis and its treatment options. If you want to learn more about this topic, um, you can go to my IBS course or to my website, mrmaya.com, which has many articles uh, and posts that deal with this important topic. SIBO, or small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, is a condition where too many bacteria grow in the small intestine. Microbes are present in the small intestine of most people, but in very small numbers. SIBO has been linked to symptoms like bloating, gas, diarrhea, constipation and abdominal pain, and has become a popular diagnosis in recent years for many patients with gut problems. But how solid is the science behind it? Here's what we know based on scientific evidence. One, SIBO is real, but it is a rare problem. SIBO has been proven to exist primarily in patients with structural bowel issues like Crohn's disease, bowel surgeries, strictures, adhesions, motility disorders such as scleroderma or chronic intestinal pseudobstruction. And in these rare patients, it is commonly associated with malabsorption, altered bowel habits, and abdominal pain, not just the common symptoms of bloating and gas. Two, SIBO is usually diagnosed by breath tests or jejunal aspirate. Physicians use breath tests like with glucose or lactulose that measure hydrogen or methane gas during exhalation after a test meal. These tests are controversial with low accuracy and lots of false positives and negatives. The gold standard test is a culture of fluid from the small intestine, a test which is rarely used in clinical practice because it's too cumbersome. Three, SIBO has been linked to IBS, but it's rarely the cause. Some studies suggest that up to 30 to 70% of people with IBS have a positive breath test, falsely implying that they may have SIBO. However, the breath test results are debated, and a growing number of experts do not agree that SIBO causes IBS or is a major cause of other abdominal symptoms. This skepticism by the thought leaders in the area has recently been published in the reputable gastroenterology journal and has been heavily debated in the field. Intestinal gas production is a normal physiological process that does not cause any symptoms unless a patient is hypersensitive to small amounts of distension or has excessive gas production. Such intestinal hypersensitivity is a hallmark of IBS, and excessive gas production is also not as common as the most common symptoms of gas bloating in IBS. Certain food components that are not fully digested in the small intestine, particularly dietary fiber and non-digestible carbohydrates, are metabolized by gut microbes into gases like hydrogen, carbon dioxide, and methane. And these gases are the primary components of intestinal gas. For the great majority of people, they don't cause any symptoms. 
It's interesting that the primary gut microbes responsible for gas production include such organisms as Bacteroides, Ruminococcus, Roseburia, Clostridium, Eubacteria, Disulfofibriol, and Methanobrevibacter. These microbes, which names you may never have heard before, along with others, contribute to the production of intestinal gas. That's correct. However, the majority of these are the same microbes that produce the beneficial anti-inflammatory short-chain acids like butyrate that are good for our gut, prevent inflammation, and which are nurtured and promote in their growth with a plant-based diet. Antibiotic treatment works for some patients. Rifaximine, a poorly absorbed antibiotic, has evolved as the standard treatment to treat nonspecific gut symptoms and abnormal breath tests. In IBS with diarrhea, Rifaximine has actually shown modest results, slightly above placebo, and usually temporary benefit in symptom relief, even in people who don't test positive for SIBO. So it must be some other mechanisms by which in those it works. But symptom improvement doesn't always mean SIBO was present or eliminated. The most likely reason for rifaximin-induced symptom improvement on a temporary basis, is a widespread inhibitory effect on the gut microbiome and on the physiologic gas production associated with the metabolism of complex carbohydrates and fiber. Revenue generated from the performance of breath tests and rifaximin sales are the main driving force, keeping the SIBO myth alive. So what's uncertain or weak in the evidence for the diagnosis of SIBO and these various tests and interventions? Poorly standardized testing. There's no universal agreement on what defines a positive breath test. Results can vary by equipment, timing, diet before the test, and individual gut differences such as gut transit. Two, the risk of overdiagnosis. Because symptoms are vague, like bloating, fatigue, and gas, and very common, SIBO is most often diagnosed too freely, even when other causes are likely. Three, questionable long-term benefits of treatment. Many patients relapse after antibiotic treatment. I've seen many patients in my practice who have come to me from another hospital or physician after several courses of rifaximine, which always give temporary relief, but they come back with the same symptoms. There's limited evidence for long-term success with diet alone for SIBO, like low FODMAP or elemental diets. Probiotics and herbal antimicrobials are sometimes used, but evidence is inconsistent or low quality. These last two points, I should correct myself, not for SIBU, but for symptoms of abdominal gas and bloating. So in summary, SIBU is a real but complex condition. In some people, especially with structural or motility issues, which are a small number of patients, it can cause significant symptoms. But in many others, the majority with these nonspecific symptoms, it's not clear whether SIBO is the cause, consequence, or most likely just a red herring. So next time you talk about SIBO, you take a medication for SIBO, or you want to change your diet because of SIBO, think about these points that speak against a diagnosis of SIBO. The FDA has also come to this conclusion and has not recognized SIBO as a billable diagnosis. Thank you for your attention.